Just before we start today's video, we want to bring you word from our sponsor, There's Been a Murder by Goliath. Goliath makes some great games, and I really love their party games like Are You Normal and Like Minds. So I was super excited when they sent me their game, There's Been a Murder. As the title suggests, someone's been killed. You and your friends are the detectives, and you have to work together to solve the murder. It's a brilliant, fully cooperative social deduction game. But if you don't work together, the killer will get away, and everyone loses. You solve the murder by getting clues through action and effect cards, and you communicate who you think is holding the murderer card. The game is easy and fun to learn, so in no time, new players can get involved in the game. I loved it because we've played it several times, and each time it's very different. So when we do play, we do several rounds in one night, and it never gets boring. In fact, I can't wait to see my friends this weekend and play it again. It's for 3 day players, and it's ages 14 and up. There's Been a Murder is a must-have for people who like puzzles, mysteries, and true crime. You can find a link to There's Been a Murder from Goliath in the description box below this video. It's perfect if you're looking for a great, fun, and easy to learn game for yourself or the game lover in your life. Number 3. Ralph Meyer In the fall of 2002, the police in Dresden, Germany received an unusual tip. A man had made a posting on a website called Cable Cafe looking for a young man who wanted to be killed and eaten. The police went to the home of the man who made the posting, 41-year-old Armin Moos. Moos was a computer technician who lived alone in the small town of Rottenburg, Germany. The police searched his property and they found body parts in his garden. They also found a videotape of Mews engaged in a disturbing act with another man. Specifically, they cut off his penis and tried to consume it. There was also a four-hour videotape of Mews dismembering the body. Mews was arrested and he told the police an odd story. In late 2000, Mews posted a message on the website Cannibal Cafe. The website is now defunct but it was a meeting place for people with cannibal fetishes. Moose posted seeking well-built man, 18 to 30 years old, for slaughter. He said that several men contacted him, but they all backed out. In March 2001, Bern Brandes, a 43-year-old engineer from Berlin, replied, writing, I offer myself to you, and I'll let you dine on my live body, not butchery, dining. On March 9th, Brandis traveled to Moose's home. He was awake when his penis was cut off, and then he was placed in a bathtub where he slowly bled. Then Moose stuck a knife in his neck. Afterward, he dismembered the body. He stored the body parts in his freezer. Over the next several months, he ate some of the body parts. Moose said that he never forced Brandis to do anything and he volunteered to be killed. Armin Moos went to trial in January 2004. He was found guilty of manslaughter. He was sentenced to eight and a half years in prison. The story was massive news across the world. One person who was fascinated by the case was 41-year-old Ralph Meyer, an unemployed house painter who lived in Berlin. In October 2004, about nine months after Moos was convicted of manslaughter, Meyer came in to the police station in Berlin. He said, there's a body in my flat. Please stop me before I eat it. Police officers went to his flat. In the bedroom, they found a torso, legs, and arms. In the refrigerator were human organs. The report did not say what happened with the rest of the body. Meyer told the police that the body was 33-year-old Joe Rakowski, a music teacher. Meyer explained that he met Rakowski online on a site for men seeking men. Rakowski was interested in sadomasochistic sex and he came over to Meyer's flat as a willing partner. Meyer said that they had sex. Then afterward, he stabbed Rakowski in the neck with a screwdriver. Meyer said that Armin Moos had inspired him, but he said that Ruskowski had not volunteered to be killed. 
Meyer said they had fantasies about cannibalizing someone for a long time. But after he dismembered the body, he didn't go through with eating any of it. Instead, he turned himself in at the police station. Ralph Meyer went to trial May 2005. He was convicted of murder, and he was sentenced to 13 years in prison. That means he would have been released in 2018 if he wasn't paroled earlier. Two weeks before Meyer went to trial in 2005, it was ordered that Armin Moose would be retried. Initially, Moose had been found guilty of manslaughter and sentenced to eight and a half years of prison. Moose's second trial started in January 2006. This time, he was convicted of murder and he was sentenced to life in prison. It's been reported that Moose is a model inmate and he even became a vegetarian behind bars. In 2020, it was revealed that he is allowed out on day passes with two officers escorting him. Number 2. Roger Dollinger Hollinsburg is an unincorporated area in Indiana. It's so small that it's never been part of the census. It's about 25 miles north of Terre Haute. In 1977, 41-year-old Betty Jane Spencer lived in a mobile home in Hollinsburg with her husband, Keith Spencer, her son, 22-year-old Gregory Brooks, and her three stepsons, 17-year-old Raymond Spencer, 16-year-old Reeve Spencer, and 14-year-old Ralph Spencer. Early on Valentine's Day morning in 1977, Betty, her son, and her stepsons were home sleeping. Keith, an engineer for a television station transmitter, was at work. Suddenly, four men burst into their home. Three of them were armed with sawed-off shotguns, and one had a 38 caliber handgun. They got Betty, her son, and her three stepsons out of bed and had them lie face down, side by side, in the living room. Two men searched the home, while the other two men kept their guns aimed at the family while they were lying on the floor. Then the third man, who was armed with a shotgun, came back into the living room, and the man with a handgun left the mobile home. The man with the handgun parked one of the family's cars at the end of the driveway, next to the car that they had arrived in. He then punctured the tires on the rest of the family's cars. The man with the handgun, who appeared to be the leader, returned to the living room. When he returned, he ordered the other three men to start shooting the family members. They shot them in the upper body and the head. At one point, one of the young men said, Don't shoot me anymore. The leader of the home invaders took one of the shotguns from his accomplices and grabbed the young man's hair. Then, from about six inches away, he fired a kill shot into the back of his head. Once the shooting was done, the leader kicked all the victims to check if they were dead. He realized that Betty was alive, so he ordered one of his men to shoot her again. After Betty was shot, the men left the mobile home. Two of them got into the car they came in, and two got into the family's car. After they were gone, Betty was able to get up. When she was shot the second time, the shock raised her and moved her wig. So the men thought they had blown her head open. Betty was able to get to a neighbor's home and help was called for. Betty was taken to the hospital and she survived. Sadly, her son and her stepsons were all pronounced dead in the home. Since none of the home invaders were wearing masks, Betty was able to describe three of them. However, since Betty was face down and experienced a traumatic experience, she wasn't sure how many men were involved in the shooting. She thought it was three to five men. She knew for sure that she didn't know any of the men. They were strangers to her. She also didn't know why they targeted her family. The police offered a $5,000 reward for information leading to an arrest. Someone called and said that 20-year-old Daniel Stonebreaker might have been involved in the murders. The police thought that this was possible because Stonebreaker looked a lot like one of the sketches. 
On March 8th, a few weeks after the murder, they brought Stonebreaker in for questioning. He admitted that he was one of the gunmen. He said that the other men were 24-year-old Roger Dolinger, 17-year-old David Smith, and 21-year-old Michael Wright. Stonebreaker told the police that a few months before the murders, he and Dolinger were watching Helter Skelter, the made-for-TV movie about the Manson murders. On the night of August 8, 1969, members of the Manson family, a cult led by Charles Manson, murdered 26-year-old Sharon Tate, who was eight and a half months pregnant, and her friends, 35-year-old Jay Sebring, 25-year-old Abigail Folger, 32-year-old Wojciech Frykowski, and 18-year-old Stephen Perrin. The next night, they murdered 44-year-old Leno LeBianca and his 39-year-old wife, Rosemary. The murders were gruesome and made headlines around the world. Eventually, Charles Manson and several of his followers were arrested for the murders. The trial was a media circus and it resulted in Manson being sentenced to death. His sentence was later commuted to life in prison. Stonebreaker said that Roger Dollinger was inspired by Manson and his family. Dollinger wanted to kill someone just to see how it felt. He wanted to take the victim's blood and write Helter Skelter on the walls and on the refrigerator, just like at the La Bianca crime scene. Later, Dollinger talked to David Smith and Michael Wright and convinced them to join him in the murders. In February 1977, Roger Dollinger was on trial for drug charges. He thought he was probably going to be found guilty and he'd be sent to prison. So he wanted to commit the murders before he was incarcerated. So on February 13th, after Dollinger spent the day in court, he and the three other men got into a rented car and drove around looking for someone to kill. They happened upon the Spencer's mobile home and thought it looked promising. Notably, it was in an isolated area. Plus, they had several late model cars parked in the driveway, so the men thought that they might have money. Drollinger had saw the barrels off the shotguns. He gave the shotguns to his three accomplices, and he carried a handgun. Stonebreaker said he started to put a handkerchief over his face, but Dollinger told him not to because no one would be left alive to identify them. Once inside the mobile home, they rounded up the family. After about an hour, on the orders of Dollinger, they opened fire on the family. Stonebreaker was charged with four counts of first-degree murder. The other three men were arrested and charged as well. Roger Dollinger was the first to go to trial. It began in September 1977. Daniel Stonebreaker testified against him. He said that Dollinger wanted to commit a Manson-style murder. Michael Wright also testified against Dollinger. He said he did the shootings on the orders of Dollinger. The third man, David Smith, was not called to testify. Finally, Betty Spencer testified and identified Dollinger as one of the home invaders. The trial lasted 13 days. The jury deliberated for only 45 minutes. Dollinger was found guilty of all four murders and he was given four life sentences. David Smith, the youngest of the group, who was just 17, went to trial next in October 1977. Smith's trial lasted for nine days. The jury deliberated for less than three hours. He was also found guilty of the four murders. He was also given four life sentences. As part of a plea deal, on November 7, 1977, Michael Wright pleaded guilty to one count of first-degree murder and three counts of second-degree murder. He was given two life terms plus two sentences of 15 to 25 years. He could request clemency after 10 to 15 years. On December 6, 1977, Daniel Stonebreaker accepted the same plea deal as Wright. He was given the same sentence. Bay Spencer always opposed the man getting clemency. 
She died in October 2004 at the age of 71. Roger Dolliger died in prison in January 2014 at the age of 61. In 2016, the United States Supreme Court ruled that people under the age of 18 could not be sentenced to life without parole. So David Smith, who was 17 at the time of the murders, was able to apply for parole. He applied in 2021 when he was 62 years old. His parole was denied. He'll be able to apply for parole again in 2026. At the time of this video, 62-year-old David Smith is serving his sentence at the Pendleton Treatment Unit in Pendleton, Indiana. 66-year-old Michael Wright and 65-year-old Donald Stonebreaker are incarcerated at the same prison. They are currently not eligible for parole. Number 1. Stephen Dorsey Devison On October 18, 1977, the police were called to some slopes near Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Los Angeles, California. The new dead body of a woman had been found. A piece of cloth was still tied around her neck. The medical examiner would later determine that she had been tied up and raped. The cause of death was ligature strangulation. She had probably been dead less than 24 hours before her body was found. She was identified as 20-year-old Yolanda Washington. Washington was a part-time waitress and she also did sex work. No arrests were made in the wake of her murder. Less than two weeks later, on November 1st, 1977, Another woman's body was discovered in some bushes on a hillside in a residential area of Los Angeles. She was identified as 15-year-old Judith Lynn Miller. She was last seen alive the day before her body was found. Judith was a runaway who was apparently doing sex work. She had been bound, sexually assaulted, and strangled to death. It was believed that she was killed elsewhere and then dumped on the hillside. Days later, on November 6, the body of 21-year-old Lisa Caston was found in Glendale, a neighborhood in Los Angeles. She had been strangled and raped. Caston worked as a waitress, but she told her mother that she was considering doing sex work because she wasn't making enough money. Caston was last seen alive the night before her body was found. She was seen leaving the restaurant where she had worked. Three days later, on November 9, 1977, 28-year-old Jane King was in Hollywood. King was an aspiring actress and model. That evening, she went missing. Two days after that, on November 11, another nude body was found. This time, the body had been dumped in West Los Angeles. The body had been there less than 24 hours. The victim had been raped, beaten, and strangled. She was identified as 18-year-old Jill Barcombe. Barcombe had moved to Los Angeles shortly before she was murdered. Nearly a year earlier, she pleaded guilty to prostitution in Syracuse, New York. At this point, the police started to think that the murders were connected. One problem was that Los Angeles had a high murder rate at the time. So other women had been raped and strangled to death during the murder spree. Also, the police didn't have any physical evidence, like fingerprints, to say definitively that the four murders were connected. It was also possible that the killer had claimed more than four victims. On November 13, 1977, 14-year-old Sonia Johnson and 12-year-old Dolores Sapita went shopping in Eagle Rock, a Los Angeles neighborhood. Afterward, they took the bus. After they got off the bus, witnesses saw them walk up to a two-tone sedan. They were talking to two men inside the car. After that, they went missing. 
On November 17, 1977, the dead body of 17-year-old Kathleen Robinson was found in some brush in the Wilshire area of Los Angeles. She had been strangled to death, but she was fully clothed and she had not been sexually assaulted. Also, unlike the other victims who had been found, Kathleen was not a sex worker, nor was she considering doing sex work, but she did frequently hitchhike. Kathleen was last seen alive the day before her body was found. She told her mother that she was going to church. Initially, the police weren't sure if Kathleen was a victim of the same killer, but eventually they included Kathleen in the list of victims. On November 20th, 1977, 20-year-old Christina Wackler's new dead body was found in the hills in Highland Park. She had been bound and sexually assaulted. Like the other victims, she had been strangled to death with a ligature. Wackler was a college student who kept to herself. She was last seen about 24 hours before her body was found. The same day that Wackler's body was found, the bodies of 14-year-old Sonia Johnson and 12-year-old Dolores Cepeda were found in a ravine north of downtown Los Angeles. They both had been raped and strangled. On November 23, 1977, the nude body of 28-year-old Jane King was found near Griffith Park. The aspiring actress and model was last seen 14 days earlier in Hollywood. She had been raped and strangled to death with a ligature. 18-year-old Lauren Wagner lived with her parents in the San Fernando Valley. On November 28, 1977, Wagner parked her car across the road from her parents' home at about 10.10 p.m. A neighbor saw two men escort her into another car. The next morning, Wagner's parents realized that she hadn't come into the house. They saw her car parked across the road and they noticed the driver's door was ajar. Later that day, Wagner's dead body was found in the Mount Washington neighborhood of Los Angeles. She had been bound, raped, and strangled. She also had electrical burns on her hands. So it appeared that she had been tortured before she was killed. At this point, the police thought that the ten murders were committed by one man whom they called the Hillside Strangler. A few weeks went by and there were no more murders linked to the Hillside Strangler. Then, on December 17, 1977, 17-year-old Kimberly Martin was called to an apartment in Hollywood. Martin was a sex worker. The apartment she was called to turned out to be vacant. Residents of the building heard her scream, but no one ended up calling 911. Martin's body was found the next day in the Silver Lake neighborhood of Los Angeles. She had been raped and strangled to death. Then, on December 24, 1977, the body of 18-year-old Paula Gwen Ward was found near the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, California. She had been strangled to death. It turned out that she was last seen with 21-year-old Carolyn Williams the day before her body was found. Williams and Ward were in a motel room together. Williams' dead body was found about three and a half hours after Ward's body was found. Her body was in a parking lot in Wilshire. She also had been strangled to death. Ward had a criminal record for minor crimes while Williams had a history of sex work. In 1975, she was arrested three times for prostitution. The police immediately suspected that was the work of the Hillside Strangler. They went to the motel where the two women were staying just before they were murdered. They talked to the clerk and he said he saw something odd. He said he saw two men carrying a woman wrapped in a blanket from their room out to a car. So he wrote down their license plate. Using the license plate, they learned that the car belonged to 40-year-old Stephen Dorsey Devizin. They learned he had been hanging out with his friend Thomas Davies. Two days after the bodies were found, Davison and Davies were arrested for the murders. 
They were questioned to see if one of them, or both, were the Hillside Strangler. But the police confirmed that they weren't serial killers. Davidson had committed the murders and Davies helped him move the bodies. Davidson had tried to imitate the Hillside murders to throw suspicion off himself. However, the police had not released many details about the Hillside murders, so he didn't get certain details right. After Davidson was arrested, the police continued to look for the Hillside Strangler. There were no more murders in 1977 or in January 1978. 20-year-old Cindy Lee Hudsmith was studying psychology and dance. She was incredibly passionate about dance and would have loved to become a professional dancer. She lived directly across the road from Christina Weckler, the ninth victim, who was killed in November 1977. On the night of February 17, 1978, Hudspeth went to meet someone to talk about a dance routine. Tragically, she never made it home. Her body was found the next day in the Angeles National Forest. Wegler's new body had been stuffed into the trunk of her car and their car was pushed over a cliff. She had been raped and strangled. Then, the murder suddenly came to an end. The police weren't sure why, but they were a bit relieved. Copycat killer Stephen Dorsey Devizin went to trial in May 1978. It was a five-day non-jury trial. He was found guilty of both murders. In June 1978, he was sentenced to life in prison. No record can be found regarding what happened to his accomplice, Thomas Davies. Unfortunately, while the copycat was taken care of, the original Hillside Strangler was still on the loose. The major break in the case wouldn't come till 11 months after the last murder with what seemed like an unrelated crime. On January 12, 1979, 22-year-old Karen Mandick and 27-year-old Diane Wilder were reported missing. The pair were roommates and they lived in Bellingham, Washington, which is over 1,200 miles from Los Angeles. Mandick worked part-time at a grocery store and she told her boss that a security guard who occasionally worked at the store offered her money to house it. The police talked to the security company and they learned that the security guard was a man named Kenneth Bianchi. Bianchi told the security company that he was at a sheriff's reserves meeting on the night the young women went missing. The police checked and there was no record of him being at the meeting. Bianchi told the police that he ended up skipping the meeting because it was about first aid and he said he didn't need any more first aid training. Later that day, Mandick's car was found abandoned on the outskirts of a wooded area. The police were called, and in the back seat were the dead bodies of 22-year-old Karen Mandick and 27-year-old Diane Wilder. The police immediately had a suspect, and that was Kenneth Bianchi. Bianchi was 27 years old, he lived with his girlfriend and infant son. The police learned they had moved to Bellingham from Los Angeles several months earlier. The police searched his house and they found stuff he had stolen while he was a security guard. So he was arrested and held in jail. The chief of police was aware of the Hillside Strangler case. He wondered if Bianchi might be the killer. He called the police in Los Angeles and they looked at Bianchi's records. It turned out they lived close to where three of the victims were last seen alive. So the lead detective on the case went to Bellingham. In Bianchi's home, they found jewelry that matched the description of jewelry that two of the victims were last seen wearing. Bianchi was confronted and he confessed to the two murders in Bellingham and three of the Hillside Strangler murders. But he said he didn't work alone in the Los Angeles murders. There were actually two Hillside Stranglers. His partner was his 45-year-old cousin, Angelo Bono. The police then began to look into the background of the cousins. 
Kenneth Biaki was born in May 1951 in Rochester, New York. His mother was an alcoholic 17-year-old sex worker and she gave him up for adoption. The Biaki family adopted him. As a child, Biaki was a compulsive liar. He was taken to the doctor several times because his mother suspected he was mentally ill. In January 1976, Bianchi moved to Los Angeles. He lived with his adopted mother's sister's son, Angelo Bono. Bono was born in October 1934 in Rochester, New York. He moved with his family to California when he was five years old. Bono showed disturbing behavior as a teenager. He bragged to his friends that he had raped young women. He also idolized the serial rapist, but he had a major criticism of the rapist. He believed that the rapist should have killed his victims as well. Bono got married when he was 22 years old. His wife went on to have five children. She filed for divorce seven years later in 1964 because of Bono's disturbing sexual desires and because he was abusive. Bono lived with other women and their children and he abused them all. He also bragged about sexually abusing his children and the children of his partners. Then in 1975, Kenneth Bianchi moved to Los Angeles. In September 1977, Bianchi and Bono found themselves short on cash, so they hatched a plan. They were going to get a group of young girls and prostitute them. They asked a young woman named Deborah Noble for a list of girls who could work for them. Noble delivered the list to them with her friend, Yolanda Washington. Bianchi and Bono discovered that the names on the list were fake, so they decided to get some revenge. They knew where Washington worked the streets, so they went to that area and found her. They raped and killed her in the back seat of Bianchi's car. Then they dumped her body. From there, they murdered nine young women together. They often pretended to be police officers and they had fake badges. Bianchi's girlfriend and young son moved to Bellingham in early 1978. She wanted Bianchi to move with her. Bono wanted him to move as well because he thought that Bianchi was unpredictable. Bono ended up telling his cousin to move, or he would kill him. So in May 1978, Bianchi moved to Bellingham and got a job as a security guard. Not long after Bianchi confessed to the murders, he recanted his confession. He also claimed he had multiple personality disorder. Nevertheless, on October 22, 1979, Angelo Bono was arrested for the murders. In June 1980, a 23-year-old woman named Veronica Lynn Compton wrote to Kenneth Bianchi in prison. She sent him her play about a female serial killer. Then they started corresponding with each other. Compton had an idea about creating reasonable doubt in his case. She would murder a woman in Bellingham to make it look like the real killer was still out there. On September 16, 1980, Compton visited Bianchi in prison. He smuggled a condom containing a semen into the visiting room inside a book and then he gave it to Compton. Compton then traveled to Bellingham, Washington. On the night of September 18th, Compton went to a tavern and met a 26-year-old woman. In the early morning hours of September 19th, she invited the woman back to her motel room. Once there, Compton tried to strangle her to death, but she failed. The woman escaped and managed to get help. Compton promptly fled the area. But she was arrested on October 3rd, 1980 in San Francisco, California. In March 1981, Veronica Compton was convicted of attempted first-degree murder. She was sentenced to life in prison. Kenneth Bianchi agreed to testify against his cousin, Angelo Bono, 
in exchange for leniency. Ono's trial was supposed to start in November 1981, but there were several delays, so it didn't officially start until spring 1982. It lasted a year and a half, making it one of the longest trials up to that point in American history. Bono had been charged with 10 murders. In November 1983, he was found guilty of 9 of the 10 murders. The only homicide he wasn't convicted of was the murder of Yolanda Washington. He was sentenced to life in prison without the chance of parole. Kenneth Bianchi was also given a life sentence. On September 21st, 2002, Angelo Bono died of a heart attack in prison. He was 67 years old. Veronica Compton was paroled in 2003. At the time of this video, 70-year-old Kenneth Bianchi is serving a sentence at the Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla, Washington. As for the Hillside Strangler copycat, Stephen Dorsey Devizin, there is no record as to what happened to him after he was sentenced to life in prison. If he is alive today, he would be about 85 years old. Thank you so much for watching today's video. And now, here's a clip from our latest video, Three Boogeymen from Around the World, from our new channel, Paranormally Listed. Number 3, Way Way Gombal. In Indonesia, there's a ghost who protects kids from neglectful parents. Wei Wei Gombal is a wrinkled old lady with fangs and breasts that hang down to her knees. When she was human, she was married and she and her husband wanted to have children. After trying for a while, the husband realized she was infertile. He became frustrated and neglected her. He'd leave her for long periods and she would feel miserable. One day, she followed her husband when he left the house. She caught him cheating on her. She became so angry that she murdered him. Their neighbors discovered what happened and they harassed her until she died by suicide. When she was dead, her spear came back as the Wei Wei Gombal. You can find a link to the rest of the video on the screen now. There is also a link to the channel in the description box below this video. Thanks again for watching.